It was a dark day. A brutal assault sent ripples across the world and marked a turning point in the struggle for India's independence. As the sun set in Jallianwala Bagh on the 13th of April 1919, hundreds of people lay dead after a battery of soldiers fired at them at point-blank range. The repercussions of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre were felt across. The tragedy also led to a great outpouring on paper as writers and poets immortalized the stories of the men, women and children who hadn't survived to see another day. As India marks a hundred years of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, literary historian Rakshinda Jalil has edited a book, Jallianwala Bagh, Literary Responses in Prose and Poetry, published by Niyogi Books. I caught up with Rakshanda to understand how contemporary scholars of the period saw the tragedy. I want to start by asking you, what made you select the pieces that you have selected in this work? You know, as a literary historian, I'm inter interested in the intersection of literature and history. I want to see that space where literature is interpreted, analyzed and made accessible by the creative writer. It could be a prose writer, it could be a poet. And I've done this in the past for the 1857, I've done it for uh, the First World War. So when coming to Jallianwala Bagh, I didn't want to see it as an isolated incident. And truly, nothing in history is standing on an island in itself. It's part of a continuum, it's part of a stream. So when we look at April 1919, we need to see what comes before it and we need to see what follows. What comes before it is a sequence of events, the most important being the First World War, 1914 to 1918. India is very much part of somebody else's war. India sends 13 lakh people, India of whom 74,000 people die, they don't come back home. A great many of these people are from Punjab, from the Northwest Frontier Province and so on. Now, coming to Jallianwala Bagh, Coming to Amritsar, this is a state which is on the boil. Why? Because certain things have been happening. We know about the Rowlett Act. We know about Montego reforms, which are held out as a kind of a benign form of British rule in India. But soon as the war ends, we, we have the other side, which is the more draconian side. So we have the Rowlett Act and we have protests against this very draconian piece of legislation which gives immense authority to the British rulers. Uh, Gandhi is suggesting uh, a protest, peaceful protest, mind you. Everybody is protesting peacefully against Montego um, and, and against Rowlett Act at this point. Why and how those uh, peaceful protests are seen to be uh, a, a second, uh, a second, uh, an, uh, a repeat of uh, 1857 is largely in the minds of uh, Gen Sir Michael O'Dwyer and General Dyer. There, there are a couple of strains in what you have said and, and let's dissect that a little, Rakshinda. The first is, you know, Punjab sends a lot of soldiers to the First World War. It is the first time that they're going to Europe, they're seeing what is happening over there and they come back with the, a fresh take on yeah. how to deal with the British, yeah. how they see the British. How did this First World War changed the, their outlook or how they saw home after sure, that. Sure. Uh, let me show you this book which mm. I have recently edited. It came out last year. This is a collection of writings on the First World War. It looks at how Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, Bangla writers responded to the war. And some of the concerns that come out are precisely the sort of things you are talking. Of course there are the political implications. Of course there is a huge cost in terms of men, materials and so on. But what is also there and which needs to be picked upon and trust the, the creative writer to pick on that is the right of passage, the coming of age. Imagine men from landlocked Punjab getting onto a ship from Bombay or Karachi, riding, uh, uh, taking a ship to Marcel or different parts of the uh, war arena. It could be West Asia, it could be ports in France and so on. And their exposure, their first big exposure in these large numbers to the West. And all of this finds uh, reflection in literature. So you have Mulkraj Anand, you have Abdullah Hussain, uh, various people writing no novels, short stories, 
and there's this lovely short story in Hindi, Chandradhar Sharma Guleri's novel, a short story called Usne Kaha Tha, about soldiers from Punjab fighting uh, in, in these very cold, muddy trenches in, uh, in France and their experiences of the war and how they come back changed by those experiences. So there is all of that and let's not forget the Ghadarites. Mm. You know, there's the Silk Letter Conspiracy, there's the Ghadar Conspiracy that is also happening at about the same time as the war is raging. So you have the Ghadar, uh, uh, Ghadarites who are active in different parts of Europe, who have gone as far away as America and Canada. And it is these people who are talking about a new kind of Bedari, as we say in Urdu, a new kind of awakening that mm. we talk about. And these people are in turn coming back with new ideas. As the war ends, of course, it's the wounded soldiers who are coming back with a, a new vision of the world. But large numbers of the Qadarites are also coming back. And Punjab is the base for many of them. And it is these people who are coming back with new ideas. New ideas that are going to be later picked up by others. They're going to be picked up by those who are making a call for, uh, for uh, Purna Swaraj, those who are talking about uh, self-rule in some form or the other. Remember also that the war years are the years when the cries for home rule are first being heard. So it is Annie Besant who is sensitizing Indians to say, let England's need be India's opportunity. So all of this is, is a very vibrant time and everything I think feeds uh, a kind of an unrest that we see in the Punjab peaceful at this point and not really talking about shaking off the yoke but asking for greater representation, asking for dominion status, asking for greater stake in, in And politics. the British are clearly spooked by this. Would yes, you like completely. to read something out of this to, Let to, me, to, uh, to explain yes. just what the thought process was at that time? I'm going to read a very, very short uh, extract from uh, the Kuliyat by Akbar al Habadi. It makes several points. It talks about the marriage between empire and trade and commerce. It talks about where and how people are getting the news. So I'll read the Urdu, which is a fairly simple Urdu, and then I'll read the translation. Cheese wo hai jo bane Europe mein. Baat wo hai jo chape pioneer mein. Europe mein jo hai jang ki quvvat badhi hui. लेकिन फुजू है उससे तिजारत बढ़ी हुई मुमकिन नहीं लगा सके वो तोप हर जगह देखो मगर पियर्स का है सोप हर जगह आई रीड द ट्रांसलेशन रियल गुड्स आर दोस दैट आर मेड इन यूरोप रियल मैटर इज दैट व्हिच इज प्रिंटेड इन द पायनियर दो यूरोप हैज ग्रेट कैपेबिलिटी टू डू वॉर ग्रेटर स्टिल इज हर पावर टू डू बिजनेस they cannot install a cannon everywhere, but the soap made by peers is everywhere. <laughs> now, interestingly, as you will see here, Naz uh, Akbar al Habadi is, is pointing to the intersection between uh, trade and commerce and empire. And this is precisely the sort of thing that Rabindranath Tagore is drawing our attention in the early years of the war. As early as December 1914, when the war is just two months old, it is Tagore who is saying it's business as usual. It is war that is giving an opportunity for capitalism to thrive hand in hand with imperialism. So it's interesting how the writer, the poet, the, the, the satirist is quick to pick up. And I think this is where literature supplements history because they give us another way of seeing history. You know, in this crucible of awakening uh, that Punjab was, wa wa was an element that came in and that came through very uh, starkly when I was reading some of the stories in the, the, this collection of the, of the nervousness in the British uh, side when the first uh, level of some violence happens, uh, there are some killings of, of British bankers for instance, there is a lady who is, uh, who is attacked. Miss Sherwood, uh, yes. Uh, yes, Miss Sherwood. And they liken it to 1857 and what happened in Lucknow. I mean, that's a very strong fear and that is used as a justification because General Dyer actually is welcomed as a hero in, 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 back, in, home. in back home. A kitty is put together, yeah. a purse of money because is presented they, they to him. Because they say that he protected us yes. and Miss yes. Sherwood herself says that he yes. protected yes. me. Yes. You have to give him that. Yeah. You know? So what 
accounted for this fear, you see? Did they never get over 1857 and what had uh, happened? Speaking for Ms. Sherwood, it must be pointed out that by indeed it's dastardly that she was attacked. It must also be pointed out that the gully, the alley in which she was attacked, the very same people from that gully uh, protected her. They took her in, they saved her and they arranged for her to be sent to the fort where the rest of the British population had taken shelter. Um, there's a very interesting story by Sadat Hassan Manto who can always be counted upon to give us the other way of seeing things. The story is called uh, Unnissa Unniska Ek Waqya, an incident from 1919. Now about the French Revolution, uh, we, we have heard it said that the first bullet that was uh, fired in the French Revolution hit a prostitute. In Manto's telling of 1919, uh, the hero, the most unlikely hero, is the brother of the two most pr uh, famous uh, prostitutes of the city. We have no means of knowing that there was such a person, but Manto gives a spin to what actually happened. And this is why I think literature and collections such as the ones I edit maybe should be of interest to larger numbers of people who occasionally find history opaque and dense and literature allows an entry. Mm. It may be magic realism, you know, uh, such as the, the kind popularized by Salman Rushdie all those years later. And we have an example of magic realism here as well. For instance, there's a particular extract that I've used in, in, my, uh, used in my collection where um, a, an old seller of fish says that inadvertently I managed to throw a fish, an old smelly fish from my pail and that hit a Gora soldier and that led to the firing. There is no such mention of a fisherman, there is no f mention of a fish that hit a Gora. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes, no matter how seemingly absurd, it allows you an entry. And sometimes the real uh, historical events are so painful, so traumatic, that they need this imaginative entry. And then history opens up for you. So what literature is doing is it gives you that entry point. And then, of course, you have accounts that are corroborated by others. Uh, one of the most painful incidents that we often don't talk about, but which needs to be talked about, is the crawling order given by General Dyer. You mentioned Miss Sherwood, the gully in which she was attacked and also given refuge in, I must point out. Uh, an order is given whereby uh, two sentries are located at two ends of that gully and whoever needs to pass that road must do so on all fours, on their bellies like an ant or a snake or a lizard. So people are required to crawl on their bellies, not just on their hands and feet, but their stomachs must touch the ground. Now that makes my flesh crawl all these years later, a hundred years later. And once again, uh, while I'd read about it, it took a fic seemingly fictionalized account by an Urdu short story writer, a man called Ghulam Abbas, who wrote a story called Rengne Wale, Those Who Crawled, mm. and how he gives a spin to an actual historical event. General Dyer did indeed give uh, such an order. order. There is a gully which was co called Rengne Wale Gully and how people who lived in those gully for mortification, for fear, for shame, for out of sheer terror, did not step out of their homes. The rubbish in front of their homes was not collected for weeks and days. There were piles of rubbish outside. If somebody was ill, they could not take them to a doctor. If somebody had died, they could not take him for a burial or for cremation. So imagine the state of affairs of those who lived on that And there were some who defied and unlikely heroes. There's the story yes. of four women yes. who, who took yes. on Paro, for yes. instance, who was yes. a shy girl who was yes. so scared and crying. Yes. And yes. yet she walked that path. You know, and it's a beautiful rendition of, of what the happened. The whole business of martyrs, and we are living in very charged times, mm. and we keep talking about martyrs. Literature shows us that they are unlikely martyrs. Of course, the conventional take from uh, Jallianwala Bagh is that all those approximately 1,800 people mm. who died are martyrs. But Krishnan Chandar, in an essay-like longish story called 
अमृतसर आज़ादी से पहले अमृतसर आज़ादी के बाद वेर इन हिज स्टोरी द ट्रू मार्टर्स आर नॉट रियली द पीपल हु डाइड आई मीन दे आर ऑफकोर्स वी वी रिकोगनाइज दम इज मार्टर्स बट इन हिज टेलिंग देर आर दीज फोर वेरी ऑर्डिनरी वीमेन एंड द नेम्स हीज गिवन दैम आर फ्राम डिफरेंट कम्यूनिटीज सो दर हिंदू सिख मुस्लिम एंड सो ऑन एंड इट इज़ दे हु चूज टू डिफाई द ऑर्डर एंड दे ऑफकोर्स गेट शॉर्ट सो I think the 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 creative writer, be it the prose writer, the novelist, the memoirist, the poet, they they give you another an alternative to the professional historians. Now there was there were two perspectives, and I want to touch upon one perspective which was very rooted to Jallianwala Bagh. That is of Nanak Singh. You have a piece of his uh, uh, poetry in the book, and we've done a lot of work around Nanak Singh. It's fascinating that he was there yeah. at Jallianwala Bagh. So he, was Bhagat Singh as an eleven-year-old. As eleven-year-old, but Nanak. Singh, it was wrote about it. Wrote yeah. about it, and there were bodies on him, and he survived that route. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, uh, take us through what his piece tells us about that moment. Nanak Singh has a fairly long career as as a writer, and in that long career, Jallianwala Bagh casts a long shadow, and I think he seems to carry the weight of Jallianwala Bagh. In my anthology, I also have another short story by a modern writer. He calls it Jallianwala Bagh Zinda Hai. So I think for a lot of writers it's not something that ended in 1919 and I think that is important. Uh of course in a purely historical sense Jallianwala Bagh marked the end a very final ending of any seeming uh, sort of continuation of of relationships. It marks the beginning of the end of British rule in in India. There is a fracture of relationships even those even Gandhi let's not forget even gandhi in the early years of the first world war is enlisting men and he's saying this is our time to help yeah. our friends in their time of need sarojini naidu a fairly important leader from the congress party has is talking about helping out and she's written this beautiful jewel like poem called uh, the sons of india uh, about the, the 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 sons of india who are lost in the first world war So I see a change a tectonic change in the political leadership of India after Jallianwala Bagh and there is no doubt in anybody's mind that this is a friendship of equals there is clearly nothing equal in this relationship there is also time when rabindranath tagore refuses the knighthood saying that there are murderers out there i don't want to accept any yeah. knighthood yeah. but you know one other thing that, that and that's among the early indian responses the early indian responses the other thing that stands out is that uh, and you put it very beautifully you say this this was the noon of of hindu muslim unity yes, yes. and it was this is what freaked out the british yes. and after which they have all the divisive uh, this divisiveness that yeah. comes into yeah. mainstream you know uh, you relations know, with absolutely with be it manto be it a much later playwright like bhishan sani who wrote this play called uh, uh, rang de basanti chola written much later everybody is commenting on or giving us an aankhon dekha hal painting pictures through words of the scene in the streets of amritsar and what is happening in those streets crowds of people largely peaceful i mean not for a minute am i am, am i and uh, saying that the 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 violence against whether it was miss sherwood or the burning of the banks was was uh, justified i'm not saying that but except for those stray incidents this is a largely peaceful crowd which is roaming around the streets of amritsar why because it's a festive time basant is around the corner and ram navmi has just taken place so it's a festive time large numbers of jats and you know peasants from the countryside around amritsar have come to amritsar they are walking around in jathas and tolis and what are they saying these large groups of people are saying hindu musliman ki jai and this i see as the high noon of hindu muslim unity N- never again do we see this kind of complete commingling of hindus and muslims of 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 great peace am- amity coming together let's look at uh the selection that you've put together there yeah. are also voices from outside there is a british voice again you know a large part of uh, Br- britain also was shocked at what yeah. was happening you know yeah. at, at something like this happening because there was a liberal socialistic side absolutely. movement that Churchill was yeah, absolutely among the Churchill. earliest uh, people yeah. to condemn so that this. is one and the other is uh, venu chitale's piece yes. uh, far off in maharashtra yeah. where suddenly a new dimension comes in when 
you see a lot of mythology being incorporated into the interpretation yeah. of what happened. Yeah. Take us through these two points. You know, in an age innocent of social media, in an age innocent of even the telephone, the radio was not really made in roads mm. in 1919. Telegram, telegraph, these are all distant mm. things waiting to happen. So in an age where word of mouth, where newspapers, where the written word has a sanctity, the Jallianwala Bagh and the, the, the terrible disruption that it causes in the political social life of Indians reaches the nooks and crannies of the popular imagination. The role of the poets, the popular poets, the role of newspaper editors cannot be sufficiently you know, highlighted because it is they who make it possible for a Venu Chitale. Of course, she's writing much later, but she's picking up how living in distant Pune, her life and the life of a family, a middle class family like hers, is disrupted, it is affected by what is happening in distant Amritsar. So, this is an, we uh, as literary historians need to join the dots. Mm -hmm. We can't see incidents in isolation. Like I said, there is a before and after to Jallianwala Bagh, but there is also a joining of the dots in different parts of the country. So, while Jallianwala Bagh is happening in Amritsar, its repercussions, I think, are felt, of course, in the three presidencies, in Madras, in Calcutta and in Bombay, but it's felt in the smaller cities. The extract I read is uh, by a man who lives in Allahabad, you know, Akbar al Habadi. So, Akbar is affected by all of this. People are affected by what is happening. Jallianwala Bagh, I don't see it as a tragedy of Punjab. I see it as an Indian tragedy. And I see the role of writers, editors, journalists in making it an Indian tragedy. Mm. You know, uh, you spoke about how your a large body of your work, in fact, all your work is in this intersection between literature and history. Yeah. My grouse is that we don't look at literature hard enough or long enough and go deep into the sources because that often gives you a very, very layered perspective on anything that's happening, yeah. right? I mean, it, it's, uh, for, for me, it's a, it's a very big problem with the way we look at history. What are the challenges when you do something like this? Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this thing of, uh, tr uh, I would like to believe that fiction is truth. You know, I would like to believe that fiction may, may dress the truth in a, in, in a garb which is maybe more colorful or less colorful or differently colored. But nevertheless, fiction does allow you to present truth in multiple ways, which doesn't mean that those ways are false or wrong or erroneous or misleading. They can be, but by and large, good literature can show you. I mean, one, it's a tru truism that literature is a mirror, a mirror that holds up, you know, and in that mirror, you see everything around you, the good, the bad, the indifferent, the unevenness, what in Urdu we say the jhol, you know, the unevenness of society. Uh, so all of that is to be seen in that mirror of, of literature. Um, the challenge really is to find things that are sufficiently accessible. They need not be opaque, they need not sound dated. When I'm talking about Jallianwala Bagh, uh, it is a challenge for me to find things in Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi and other languages that at least I'm able to access and interpret and, and which makes it in a word accessible, mm. which does not date these events because I I was, was, was very intrigued when I came across this story in Punjabi uh, called Jalian Wala Bag Zinda Hai. Because to me that meant that sometimes very big events cast a long shadow. And that shadow does not go away with the eclipsing of that event. You know, it affects our lives in different ways, mm -hmm. you know. So I think whether it is the partition, whether it is 1857, whether it is the First World War, we have important events in our recent history, I don't want to go very far back, I don't want to go to Mughal times and so on. I'm just talking over the past hundred years. And we can pick up landmark events and we can find correlations. Sure. You know, I learned a lot when I looked at the, at the stories uh, because I think while we know of the event and that's how it started it, while we know of the event, we don't know of the prelude and the angst that people had to go through, the crawling across yeah. the street. It's, I mean, these are these are powerful symbols which come together in the fiction. But as somebody who's worked on 
1857, on the First World War, on now Jallianwala Bagh. Yeah. What is it that you learned? What was the new perspective that you got when you were pouring through all of these stories from different sources? Allow me to give you an example from uh, my work on the partition. You know, I was uh, translating this novel by Krishna Chandar called Ghaddar, Traitor, written in uh, the 60s, but it's located in uh, August, September of 1947. And I was translating it at a time uh, two years ago when there was great ferment in our universities, Hyderabad, JNU, all of it, you know. And the word Ghaddar was being bandied about all the time. We were calling each other anti-national and suddenly there was a kind of a jingoistic nationalism. And it occurred to me how tragic and sad it is that we, there are lessons in history, of course, but there are lessons to be learned from literature as well. Here is a novel called Ghaddar, which is precisely about how somebody who has the courage to step away from the mob is deemed a Ghaddar by the mob. Seventy years later, are we going to allow the mob to dictate how we must think, feel and behave? And we have lessons. It's not as though we don't have lessons, but we choose not to learn from those lessons. Thanks so much, Rakshanda, and well, love the work that you're doing. Keep it up Thank and you. hope to do lots more with you on the Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.